First, Sartorio was born in Buenos Aires, in Argentina. Uh, she was educated at the University of Buenos Aires and at uh, the MIT, uh, where she got her PhD. And since 2009, she is uh, now Associate Professor of Philosophy at the University of Arizona, uh, where she has taught, pre uh, well, she has taught also previously at the University of Wisconsin in medicine. And she works at the intersection of uh, metaphysics, uh, the philosophy of action, and moral theory. And, well, this, uh, this uh, conference is called uh, uh, Free Will and Causation, and she has uh, just published a book on, which is called Causation and Free Will, so you may have noticed the close connection between her interests and our present interests. So it's uh, a great pleasure to, uh, to listen today to uh, her talk, uh, which will be about the actual causes and free will. Thank you so much. So I reverse the order because I think causation is more important than free will. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Given the topic of the conference, I thought I'd start by saying a few words about the roles that I think uh, causation plays um, in the problem of uh, determinism and free will. So um, first, you might think that there's um, a role that causation plays in the formulation of the problem itself. So uh, it's very tempting to say something like this. The problem seems to be that if determinism is true, then everything that we do is deterministically caused, has deterministic causes that trace back to the time before we were born. Now, um, people like Van and Wagen resist this because they think that causation is too obscure a topic to be talking about. Um, he thinks that um, we can generate the problem quite easily without the concept of cause by simply um, doing it in terms of entailment, given the full statement of the conditions of the world many, many years ago and full statement of the laws, it follows that I will do a certain thing now. Notice that we haven't mentioned the word cause at all in that formulation of the problem. Um, I still think that even if that is true, uh, causation uh, has a role to play in the formulation of the problem, and um, I talk about this in more detail in other places, but let me just say briefly why I think this. Basically, because I think that the problem only arises, um, at least in the way that people have thought about the problem, assuming that um, what we do is the deterministic uh, result or is entailed by uh, conditions that are beyond our causal reach. That's why the problem arises. If, say, we were able to travel back in time, which we're not, at least not right now, um, and causally influence the, um, the state of the world in the past, then we would have some sort of causal control over the past, and that would not give rise to the problem, at least not in the same kind of way, because then if we can have causal control over the past, even if the past determines the present, it seems that we could have indirectly some sort of control over the present in that kind of way. All right, so um, it, causation plays a role in the formulation of the problem, at least in this way, uh, in the sense that the conditions that are said to give rise to um, our acts in the present are conditions that are beyond our causal reach. And also, of course, that goes for the laws of nature as well. But more importantly, uh, for my purposes here, I think causation plays um, a key role in the solution to the problem. And in particular, if you're a compatibilist, and I'm not going to argue that you should be a compatibilist here. I'm going to sort of assume that <laughs> you want to be a compatibilist. If you are a compatibilist or want to be a compatibilist, I think causation should play a central role in your solution to the problem. Uh, very roughly, and uh, again, I discuss this um, in more detail in my book in particular, I think causation um, can do that because it has certain properties that um, ground moral responsibility. Um, so they can make agents morally responsible for things. Um, so 
I'm going to say a bit about my compatibilist view here. Basically, the idea is that um, if you want to be a compatibilist, you should say that um, um, free action isn't something like uncaused action, action that has no causes, but quite on the opposite. It should be, you should say that uh, free action is action that is caused, just caused in the right kind of way, which is a very standard compatibilist thing to say. Okay, so I'm going to start by uh, contrasting two models of freedom, the classical alternative possibilities model that some people uh, mentioned today, and the model that I like, also was mentioned briefly in the last talk, uh, the one uh, introduced by Harry Frankfurt or by some of Harry Frankfurt's ideas and his examples. I'm going to call that the actual causes model. So I'm interested in this debate between the alternative possibilities model and the actual causes model. And I want to give, um, based, based on my uh, compatibilist view, which is a version of the actual causes model, I want to give a sort of new argument for the actual causes model. It's not going to be a full argument for the view in the sense that I take that to be a knockdown argument or anything like that, but something like uh, important considerations that seem to point um, in favor of the actual causes model. Okay, so first of all, the debate arises, for me at least, because I take it that both models have um, quite a bit of initial plausibility. Both models do. So the alternative possibilities model is the idea that uh, freedom requires the ability to do otherwise or access to alternative possibilities of action. This is a very intuitive idea. It's very natural uh, to understand freedom in terms of having options to choose from. And also, especially when you think about blameworthiness, right, uh, or blaming people for things that they do, it seems very natural to believe that if there's nothing that an agent could have done, out, so if the agent couldn't have done otherwise on a certain occasion, we can't generally blame him for what he does. How could we be blameworthy if we couldn't have done anything else? So especially in the case of blameworthiness, this seems to be a very intuitive idea. On the other hand, and this is something that I think people tend to not emphasize enough, the actual causes model is um, also intuitively very plausible, and it seems to be in conflict with the alternative possibilities model. Um, these are ideas by Frankfurt again. So he pointed out that um, if you do something on a certain occasion and then you find out that there were other factors about your circumstances that played absolutely no role in explaining why you acted in the way you acted, and you try to point to the existence of those factors to say, excuse your behavior, there's something inappropriate about that. Factors that don't play any role whatsoever and why you made the choice that you made are intuitively irrelevant to um, your responsibility. So that leaves, of course, as the only relevant factors, the factors that actually explain why you acted. And assuming we understand this in terms of causation or causal explanation, those would be the actual causes of your behavior. That seems to um, leave no room for the relevance of alternative possibilities and unless you can somehow build the alternative possibilities into the actual causes. Um, but if it's just the existence of certain counterfactual scenarios where the agent acts in a different way, that seems completely irrelevant because they're not part of the actual explanation of the behavior. So he illustrates that with Frankfurt style examples as they've been called after Frankfurt. Um, so again, we talked about one example before. In honor of Frankfurt, I call my example Frank and Fort. Um, so nobody's laughing. I hope that doesn't mean people are napping. <laughs> okay, smile. It smile counts. So um, the agent is Frank. He makes a certain choice. He makes the choice to kill his enemy Fort on the basis of his own reasons. Uh, but there's this neuroscientist in the background who installed this chip in Frank's brain. Had he hesitated making that choice, 
the neuroscientists would have intervened by activating the chip, which would have resulted in Frank's making exactly the same choice, the choice to shoot fur. But as a matter of fact, he doesn't have to because he does it completely on his own. So Frankfurt says, given that he never intervenes, it seems that um, the actual sources or the actual causes or the actual causal explanation of his behavior is exactly the same as if the neuroscientist hadn't even been present to begin with because he doesn't actually intervene. And those causes, those actual sources, are enough to make the choice a free choice, right? That's all we need to explain why the agent acted or uh, chose freely. Okay, so we have these two models and both of them, at least for me, seem to have intuitive plausibility, but they seem to be in tension with each other. So what I wanna do is, uh, again, uh, revisit this debate by completely bypassing what tends to be the standard way of thinking of this debate, which is, well, let's think more carefully about these Frankfurt cases. Frankfurt took them to mean um, or to show that the alternative possibilities principle is false because here we have an agent who seems to be responsible but had no ability to do otherwise. Uh, and people have responded in different ways to this attack. I wanna completely bypass that debate. So I don't wanna use Frankfurt cases to argue for the actual causes model. All I wanna do um, is use them as an illustration as I've just done of what I take to be the motivation for the, model, for the model in the first place. This idea that all that really matters is the actual causes, right? You can't point to factors that are not part of the actual explanation to excuse your behavior. Okay, um, could you let me know when I've spoken for like 35 minutes so that I have a sense? Thank you. Okay, so here's a difference between the models. It's a structural difference that, again, isn't sufficiently emphasized, but I think it's pretty standard to think about the models in this way. Basically, it concerns necessary versus sufficient conditions. I take it that the most charitable way of understanding the alternative possibilities model is as giving a necessary condition on freedom, right? PAP, the principle of alternative possibilities, is usually taken to say agents act freely in the sense required for more responsibility only if they could have done otherwise. That leaves open that there could be other conditions that have to be met in order for the agent to act freely. But a necessary condition is the ability to do otherwise. On the other hand, the actual causes model, the one that says all that matters is the actual causes seems to give something like a sufficient condition, something like the idea that uh, here's a set of um, factors or facts. Those are the only ones that are relevant to freedom, meaning they're sufficient for freedom. You don't need anything else, right? If uh, what you have is a full causal explanation of the behavior, that's all you need in order to determine whether the agent acts freely or not. So there's this important structural difference, and uh, in particular, given that the AP alternative possibilities model only gives a necessary condition, that means that it's completely consistent with um, their proponents saying that actual causes do matter for freedom, and that's a good thing, because of course actual causes are relevant to freedom. Nobody should deny that, right? It matters to whether you act freely, whether your choice was the actual result of a normal process of deliberation, or whether it was the result of manipulation or coercion or something like that. Of course it matters, right? So again, the most charitable way of understanding the model, I think, is as allowing for all of these things, but also saying that you need alternative possibilities. This is gonna be important in what comes later. Okay, um, just a few more words about the models. This is crucial because this is what distinguishes my view from other actual causes uh, view. My, my view is um, quite different from other actual causes um, models or, or views that are within 
uh, what people generally uh, call the AC model or the actual sequence model or something like that. So um, I take it that um, there's these two central claims that uh, define the actual causes model. There's a claim about grounding and there's a claim that follows from the grounding claim and it's a supervenience claim. So the grounding claim says uh, that facts about freedom are exclusively grounded in facts about actual causes. Um, exclusively grounded in those facts, right? And then you probably have to add, to add, well, if facts about actual causes are grounded in other things, then presumably, unless we have some reason to reject the transitivity of grounding in this particular case, presumably those facts that ground the facts about actual causes also ground the, the facts about freedom, right? So it's freedom, facts are grounded in facts about actual causes, and whichever other facts may ground those facts about actual causes. This, I think, entails a supervenience claim. Freedom supervenes on actual causes, so facts about freedom supervenes, supervene on facts about actual causes, meaning that there is no difference in freedom without a difference in actual causes, or if you have exactly the same or relevantly the same causal chain, uh, the agent is equally free or unfree in both cases. Uh, Frankfurt-style examples illustrate that again, because as I said before, the idea is that given that the neuroscientist never intervenes, his presence is irrelevant. So if we think about two cases, one where the neuroscientist is present, the Frankfurt case, and another one where he isn't even present to begin with, the actual causes of the behavior are the same in both cases, and if that's all that matters, right, and freedom supervenes on facts about actual causes, the agents must be equally free or unfree. In this case, free. An important thing to note is that these aren't just claims about actual facts. The claim isn't just that freedom supervenes on what actually happens. The claim is, and I think what's motivated by these Frankfurt cases or by Frankfurt reasoning, um, is the idea that what actually explains why the agent acted, the actual causes of the behavior, that's all that matters. So it's stronger than just the claim that it's all about actual facts. Okay, so my argument, uh, again, it's a partial argument uh, it's basically an argument from simplicity. So now that we know that there's this structural difference uh, between the two models, right? So the AP model allows for actual causes to be relevant. It's just that it wants to add more things. The AC model seems, in a straightforward way, it seems like a simpler view of freedom, right? It requires less. So um, what follows from this? Well, not a lot, but at least it seems to follow that we would need good reasons to prefer the more complex model. Okay? So what I want to do in the rest of the talk is basically examine one possible set of reasons and argue that it doesn't work. Of course, I, don't, I can't um, um, pretend to cover all the possible reasons that there could exist here or anywhere. <laughs> Uh, but I'm going to talk about this particular uh, potential set of reasons and explain why it doesn't work. If so, we're back to um, both of them have intuitive uh, plausibility. One of them is simpler, so we should go with the simpler one. Okay, and the strategy is basically to look at, uh, to think about Frankfurt cases again. When Frankfurt gave the examples, he thought he was giving counterexamples um, to the alternative possibilities view. So could um, the advocate of the alternative possibilities view try to give counterexamples to the uh, actual causes model? So and it's like I'm turning the debate about Frankfurt cases around and asking about potential cases that could show the opposite, right? Instead of showing that uh, the alternative possibilities model is false, they would show that the actual causes model is false which uh, would mean that um, it's not true that facts about actual causes are sufficient, right? But we need something else in addition to that. What could that be? Alternative possibilities, okay? So 
again, I talk about this more detail in other, in other places, but the idea is to look for possible examples that they could try to give and uh, argue that they're not good reasons to prefer the AP model because the AC model has a very good response, has a very good explanation of what's going on in those cases. So here I'm just going to focus on one type of case. It's very common to use examples like addicts or extreme addicts, people who intuitively couldn't have done otherwise to motivate the alternative possibilities view. So I'm focusing on that type of case here for that reason. <coughs> so compare the case of an extreme addict, somebody who, again, we would intuitively say doesn't act freely when he is moved by the desire to take the drug because he couldn't have done otherwise, according to the AP model. Compare that to the case of a non-addict um, who um, could have done otherwise, still moved by the desire to take the drug on that particular occasion, but intuitively he acts freely because he could, he could have done otherwise. So this is according to the AP model again. What could the AC model say about that? Could we use um, that pair of cases as counterexamples to the AC model? That's the, the question. And it turns out to be quite challenging, I, I, uh, I argue, uh, to find a relevant difference according to the AC model. Remember that I've, um, um, I'm understanding the AC model in terms of the grounding and supervenience claims, where I take that very seriously. The idea is, if there's a difference in freedom, there must be a difference in the actual causes of the behavior. And it's hard to find that difference. So, strategies that fail. Well, first, the, the most um, uh, naive response would be to say something like, well, there's a difference in the strength of the desire. Right? In the case of the addict, the desire must be stronger, otherwise he would be able to resist it, than in the case of the non-addict. But that's just not going to work, because of course, they could be equally strong, but for some reason or other, um, one agent is um, um, more able to resist that desire than the other, right? And again, what we want is that resistibility or irresistibility being captured in the actual sequence of events, right? So the strength of the desire isn't doing the work in that kind of case. You could say, and this is uh, closer to what people have actually said, people who have defended the AC model. Well, let's look at the behavior in other possible worlds, what the agent does in other possible worlds. Um, imagine, for example, that the addict and the non-addict have a very close friend, and that on that occasion, uh, where, they're, um, where they have the desire to take the drug, a friend knocks on their door asking for their immediate help. The addict would not help him, say, if he's an extreme addict, but the non-addict would. In that case, he would not take the drug, he would help his friend instead, because he would understand that that's a good reason to not take the drug and help his friend. Um, Fisher and Gravitza um, take um, a similar approach in that they take the actual mechanism, but then they ask about the reason's responsiveness of that mechanism, and that has to do, that goes back to what happens in other possible worlds. Right? So it's a view of that kind, uh, ultimately. So what I want to say is that, again, this doesn't help unless this is somehow reflected in the actual sequence of events leading to the behavior. <coughs> Who cares what the agent does in other possible worlds if that is not reflected in the actual causes of the behavior? The motivation for the actual <coughs> causes model, again, is that the only facts that are relevant are the facts that actually explain what the agent does. So if we really buy that, we can't take this sort of approach. A similar um, but slightly different response would be to appeal to the agent's actual dispositions. The uh, addict and the non-addict have different dispositions. Okay, for whatever reason, they ended up with these different dispositions, and they're actual, right? They have them or no, no don't have them. Um, 
But the problem is that they're unmanifested, right? In the case where the friend doesn't knock on the door asking for the help, who cares if the uh, non-addict has the disposition to help his friend if that's not happening in the actual world? Therefore, it can be part of the actual explanation of the behavior. So none of these strategies are going to work. So my argument is that there is a difference in the actual causes of the behavior between the addict and the non-addict, and that this generalizes to other cases. Um, my idea is that the difference in the actual causes concerns other factors that are in fact causally explanatory and that are different from the desire to take the drug itself. Because as we've seen, that's not going to work. We can't appeal to just the strength of the desire in each case. So there are other factors that also explain why the agent acted in those cases. Um, and there's a difference, a relevant difference, between the causal explanations in the case of the addict and the non-addict. And again, uh, what I'm going to say is that not only is this um, a plausible explanation of the difference, but I think it's a better explanation than the explanation that um, the alternative possibilities model offers. OK, so to um, motivate this, consider this other example first. Say that I have this cat who is you know, very independent, as cats usually are. So on a certain morning, my cat decides to go for a walk to get some fresh air. And imagine that I did too. I felt like uh, going out for a walk so to get some fresh air. So I went on my walk that same morning. So it seems, when you look at this case uh, at first sight, it seems like they have very similar explanations. There's the desire to get some fresh air, and maybe some beliefs, and those together result in my going out for a walk. However, what I want to suggest is that the explanations are not, in fact, the same, and in a way that's going to matter for my purposes here. So to use examples similar to uh, the example of the friend from before, imagine that my phone had rung a second earlier and that I usually pick up the phone when it rings, which is not actually true, but let's pretend that it is. Uh, imagine that my neighbor had knocked on my door asking for my help, and then I would have um, postponed at least my morning walk. Imagine that my spouse begs me to stay and help him on a certain household chore or something. Uh, I would have been disposed to stay, and so on and so forth. So what I claim is that um, when I decide to go on my walk that morning, I don't just do it because I have the desire to get some fresh air. I also do it for this long set of reasons. The phone didn't ring a second earlier, so that's a fact right, about the actual world. The phone didn't ring, that's why I ended up going on my walk. My neighbor didn't knock on my door, my spouse didn't beg me to stay, so on and so forth. Now, my cat couldn't care less about phones and neighbors asking for help and spouses and all that stuff. So obviously, my, my cat isn't responsive to those kinds of uh, facts. So the explanation of his behavior doesn't include reference to all these reasons or absences of reasons. So what I want to say is that when you look at the addict and the non-addict, there's a similar difference in the explanation of the behavior. It concerns um, how they respond or if they are responding to absences of reasons. So uh, the non-addict would be like me in the example of my cat and I. He took the drug because in addition to you know, being moved by the desire to take the drug, because no family member knocked on his door asking for help, because his best friend didn't call on his cell with, a, with an immediate request, because the fire alarm didn't go off, and so on and so forth. But the addict, assuming again it is a very extreme addict, isn't responsive, given his condition, to these kinds of reasons. So when he decided to take the drug on that occasion, um, those facts were not part of the explanation of his behavior. 
Uh, brief note, I'm assuming I'm doing well on time, which is very surprising. Not yet 35 minutes. Okay. Um, brief note on dispositions, given that I talked about dispositions before. Um, so again, you might have thought of uh, explaining the difference in terms of dispositions, and I said that this is not going to work. Uh, in the case of the non-addict, he has different dispositions from the addict. He has the disposition to respond to this range of reasons, uh, which the addict doesn't have. But as I said before, the disposition isn't actually manifested, so it isn't part of the actual explanation of his behavior. But there's a difference be between the role of the disposition and the role of the absences of reasons on my account. The absence of reasons are actually explanatory, right? The non-addict did take the drug because, among other things, his friend didn't ask for his help. The disposition is not part of the explanation, but the absences of reasons are. However, and this might sound surprising at first, but um, I, I think what's going on is, remember on the uh, actual causes model, the freedom facts are grounded in the facts about actual causes, which can themselves be grounded in other things. And what the disposition is doing in this case, I think, is it's helping ground the relevant causal fact. It's because the non-addict has the disposition to respond to these reasons, that he is in fact causally responding to the absence of these reasons. So the disposition does do some work. It's just that um, the work that it does is not by itself being part of the causal explanation, but by it grounding um, the relevant actual causal fact. So the view, very roughly, is uh, it's like an actualist version of a reasons responsiveness account and a compatibilist one. Uh, it says roughly, when agents act freely, they are actually causally responding to a range of reasons or absences of reasons. There's going to be lots of absences of reasons in addition to the presence of positive reasons that uh, help rationalize their behavior. So going back to the relation between causes and freedom, on this view, as you can see, um, free action isn't uncaused action. Quite on the contrary, free action is more caused than um, unfree action. Because in order for the act to be free, as in the case of the non-addict, it has to be caused by, in addition to the desire, a whole range of uh, absences of reasons that rationalize the behavior. So you need more causes in order to be free. So going back to the argument from simplicity, um, the idea was they're both, the, the two models are intuitively plausible. One of them is a simpler model. We would need a good reason to prefer the more complex model. Uh, could this be a reason, a case, where it seems that we need to appeal to alternative possibilities? The addict versus non-addict case was my main example. Uh, I argued that um, that's not the case because there is a perfectly uh, actualist or actual sequence type explanation, one that is just in terms of actual causes, um, of the difference in freedom between the addict and the non-addict. It's not just a, uh, an explanation, I think it's a difference that everybody should accept, right? Everybody should accept that there is this difference between the explanation of my cat's behavior and my behavior. Everybody should accept then, by the same token, that there's this difference between the explanation of the addict behavior and the non-addict's behavior. And once you have that explanation just in terms of actual causes, it's like we don't need any uh, role for the alternative possibilities to play. And it, not for these reasons, right? It's not like we need to appeal to alternative possibilities to explain the difference in freedom between the two agents. So perhaps there's still reasons to prefer the alternative possibilities model, but those reasons don't have to do with there being examples that show that we need alternative possibilities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.